Good afternoon. I'm Prem Paul, Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development at uh, your great, great University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for our Spring Nebraska Lecture. It's the first of the 2012 Chancellor's Distinguished Lecture Series. A special welcome also to those joining us via the live web stream. We fielded many questions about the webcast and we're glad to be able to provide today's lecture to a worldwide audience. The Nebraska Lectures are an interdisciplinary lecture series designed to foster communication among students and faculty in different academic areas and among the people of Lincoln and Nebraska. The Nebraska Lectures are sponsored by the UNL Research Council in cooperation with the Office of the Chancellor and Office of the Research and Economic Development. The Research Council is composed of our faculty from across many disciplines at UNL. The Council solicits nominations for Nebraska Lectures from our faculty on the basis of major recent accomplishments and the lecturer's ability to explain their work to a multidisciplinary audience. Selection as a Nebraska lecturer represents the highest recognition the council can bestow upon an individual faculty member. The research council also sports several competitive awards and programs designed to encourage and enhance research, creative and scholarly activities for all UNL faculty. That money comes from the University of Nebraska Foundations, and we're very appreciative of the donors who have provided money and this run through our office. So if you are willing to contribute money or in a good mood, uh, please do contribute. Uh, it, a, a few words about our today's format. Following uh, our lecture, uh, Dr. Susan Swear, Chair of the Research Council, and Professor of Educational Psychology will moderate a question and answer session. For those of you who don't know who Susan is, Susan is uh, a, a major uh, uh, exciting professor. She has uh, gained just uh, in the last few years uh, a national uh, recognition, uh, participated in the White House uh, 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 a special program uh, on uh, bullying, and she is really a, a national, international expert in anti-bullying uh, uh, area. And she recently was seen on the stage with Lady Gaga, and she uh, gave interview to in TV stations and radio stations all over the country. So Susan, uh, we're delighted that you could make it here today. After uh, uh, the discussion that Susan will lead, uh, we'll move to the reception in the Heritage Room, which is across the hall. Now, I would like to introduce uh, our sign language interpreter for today's uh, lecture, Thomas Beyer. Thank you for your assistance, uh, uh, Thomas. Please uh, join me in thanking him. I think the person who's going to introduce our uh, lecturer uh, is well suited for this job. He is not only known uh, for uh, leading the great University of Nebraska-Lincoln to great heights, uh, providing tremendous leadership in academics, but also in athletics. He served on NCAA board, and uh, he has led our university into Big Ten. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Chancellor Harvey Perlman. Thank you, Prem. It's always anticipated waiting for, to see how Prem's going to introduce me. Um, it's my distinct honor and privilege to introduce a colleague and a good friend, Josephine Joe Petuto, the Richard H. Larson Professor of Constitutional Law at the University of Nebraska College of Law. She joined the faculty of the University of Nebraska College of Law in 1974. Among the courses she teaches are federal jurisdiction, constitutional law, sports law, and criminal procedure. In 2003, she, the college alumni honored her with its outstanding faculty award. 
She has a bachelor's degree in journalism from Douglas College, a master's in English literature from Seton Hall University, and a JD from the Rutgers University Law College, where she was editor-in-chief of the Rutgers Law Review, best oralist in the Rutgers Intramural Moot Court Competition, and captain of the Rutgers National Moot Court Team. Joe's professional and academic vita show a long list of accolades and accomplishments, but it is her expansive knowledge and distinguished record of service as this university's faculty athletic representative to the National Collegiate Athletics Association that has triggered our invitation to her to deliver today's lecture. She has been UNL's faculty athletic rep since 1997, currently as president of the Division IA Faculty Athletic Representatives. She represents the university on NCAA committees and is a member of the governance groups of the Big Ten Conference. She's one of three faculty athletic representatives on the NCAA-wide Student Athlete Affairs Group Advisory Committee. She has testified before the U.S. House of Representatives, Subcommittee on the Constitution on Due Process and NCAA Infractions hearings, chaired the Division I Committee on Infractions where she developed a national reputation as a hard-nosed interrogator unafraid of high-profile coaches and athletic directors. She has been an expert witness on NCAA processes and litigation in 2002. She was named the Outstanding Faculty Athletic Representative by the All-American Football Foundation. Few, I think, appreciate the importance of the FAR, as they're known in the trade, in the current climate of intercollegiate athletics. She is the voice of the faculty, protector of academic values in the day-to-day -day operation of the athletic enterprise, she must be prepared to say no to high-profile coaches, athletic directors, and even on occasion, the chancellor. I can assure you she has no difficulty performing that role. In an era where intercollegiate athletics has the capacity to undermine the reputation of the entire university, we are fortunate to have someone of Joe's integrity and courage. It's been my good fortune to have been counseled by Joe in the Byzantine structure and rules of the NCAA. She has titled her lecture, The NCAA, Who, What, When, Where, How, and Certainly Why. Please join me in welcoming Professor Josephine Petuto. Well, thanks. My new goal in life after that is to be introduced often. To quote Shakespeare, I can no other answer make but thanks and thanks. First of all, to all of you for coming, to Harvey, longtime college and for a colleague and friend, for everything he's done for UNL and for everything we expect him yet to do, to Prem Paul for how he and his staff enhance UNL's mission and visibility by supporting faculty research initiatives and attracting research funds, to the faculty members on the research council for all their time, effort, and work to Karen Underwood for her careful shepherding of all the logistics of this lecture, to Liz Bansett for all her considerable help with the visual and audio accompaniment today. Uh, I'm told that this lecture probably holds the record for the number of slides we'll use. Anyone who knows me knows that that's a remarkably amusing statement that I just made and that all the visual and audio are going to be directly the contribution of Liz. To Diane Schiesler at the law school for her help in day-to-day um, -day work of mine, and to Mike Hoff for nominating me for this lecture. Mike is a great colleague and maybe the best uh, chair of a committee with whom I have ever served. And sorry to say, that covers a whole lot of territory. The topic for today is the NCAA, the National Collegiate Athletic Association. Much discussed, much misunderstood, much maligned. Most everybody's malicious, evil empire. We talk about the NCAA in the singular, but in all but title, it's multiple of multiples. Three divisions, division one with three subdivisions, including the football bowl subdivision, what most of us mean when we say NCAA. The NCAA has boards of directors comprised of presidents and chancellors. It has councils, cabinets, and committees whose members are faculty and athletics administrators from member institutions and conferences. The NCAA is the national office staff that administers NCAA programs and championships and facilitates the work of the boards, councils, and committees. Ultimately, the NCAA is an association of four-year colleges and universities 
which of course includes UNL. So here's a thought for any of you NCAA bashers out there. We have met the NCAA and it is us. The NCAA is the National Collegiate Athletics Association, not the National Collegiate All-Purpose Association. It exists to manage athletics competition, not everything that happens on a campus. UNL unilaterally can and does, and for that matter should and must, define its mission, manage its campus, hire faculty and staff, and administer standards applicable to students and student athletes alike, including admissions decisions, student conduct codes, degree programs, and the requisites for those degrees. What UNL unilaterally cannot do is organize collegiate athletics competition, develop playing rules binding on all teams, run a championship, or assure some level of competitive balance among teams. Enter the NCAA. All organized competition, professional and amateur, needs competitive balance. Competitive balance in part comes through rules limiting who is eligible to compete. Olympic athletes get on their national teams by placing high in qualifying competitions and by their citizenship. For PGA Tour events, eligibility comes from priority point rankings based on past wins and money earned. But eligibility rules are not the sole path to competitive balance. In the America's Cup competition years ago, Dennis Conner, one of the yacht owners, not only signed a full crew to sail for him, but he signed additional crew members so they could not sail against him. To avoid such stockpiling, all professional leagues have limits on the number of players that can be carried on team rosters. In addition to eligibility rules and roster limits, getting to competitive balance also means constraining big money owners from signing all the top players. Think George Steinbrenner. The NFL and NBA use salary caps. Major League Baseball tries through a luxury tax directed specifically at its biggest spending owners. The NCAA has no roster limits per se, but its caps on scholarships awarded per team serve much the same purpose. An Alabama booster once paid over $140,000 to get a recruit to come and play football at Alabama. A big violation, in case you're wondering. NCAA ru rules such as those prohibiting extra benefits are intended to constrain big budget schools with such, shall we say, enthusiastic, well-heeled boosters from emulating George Steinbrenner and nabbing all the four and five star athletes coming out of high school. Amateur athletics competition in the United States by and large means college students. NCAA academic requirements help assure that student athletes are students as well as athletes. They also help with competitive balance. The legendary George Gipp of Notre Dame fame reportedly preferred to frequent bars and pool halls rather than attend class. Gipp was expelled in his junior year and got back in when donors and alumni intervened. NCAA academic eligibility rules would have forestalled Gipps' Notre Dame career and deprived us of one of the most famous sports anecdotes of all time. Someday when the team's up against it, brakes are beating the boys. Ask them to go in there with all they've got. Win just one for the Gipper. I don't know where I'll be then. And it's certainly one of the most maudlin. <laughs> My research centers on process. Substance equals the actual decision or rule or constitutional protection. It's the meal on which we dine. Process is how a rule gets made or how we implement constitutional protections. It's the chef preparing the meal and the waiter serving it. Process matters. Even a cordon blue meal can be ruined if the waiter drops it on your lap. Systems work because we adhere voluntarily even when we don't like the result. We do this because we trust we were treated fairly. When governments don't generate trust and buy-in, they call out the troops. 
When voluntary associations don't generate trust and buy-in, members walk away. Process helps us structure organizations and decisions to get buy-in from stakeholders. Sometimes compromise is possible, and process allows us to get to a place that reasonably accommodates all sides. But when compromise is not possible, when we'll, there'll be winners and losers, then getting the process right is imperative. In litigation, process equals an unbiased fact finder, the same rules applying to all of us, and a chance to tell our side of the story. In legislation, process means input in the delineation of the rules that bind us. If the American colonists back in 1770 felt that they were included in decisions about taxation, they might not have thrown that tea into Boston Harbor. And today, we'd have a national anthem easy to sing. I have written about how process works in constitutional cases, criminal prosecutions, and litigation in federal and state courts. Then I was named Nebraska's faculty athletics representative. That prompted a close, close look at college athletics and the structure and organization of the NCAA. For a researcher whose focus is process, the NCAA is a veritable petri dish. There are lots of challenges to getting NCAA process right. First is the diversity of NCAA members. There are more than 350 schools in Division I and about 120 in the FBS. Division I schools are public, private, and religiously affiliated. They range from Ohio State, a land-grant PhD awarding university with 52,000 students, to Wofford College with 1,400. They include schools like Texas, with athletics budgets over $150 million and its own TV network, and schools like Michigan, with sold-out stadiums seating over 100,000. And then there's Presbyterian College, with no varsity football and a campus operating budget of, 180, of $50 million. Division I includes the major FBS schools that award all the athletic scholarships and NCAA rules permit and Ivy League schools that don't offer athletic scholarships. They cover schools like Nebraska that fund athletics with no state aid and contrib contribute some funds to the greater campus, and schools such as Rutgers that subsidize athletics to the tune of $27 million, while the academic side endures budget cuts, program elimination, and a salary freeze. NCAA diversity extends beyond its member colleges and universities. Individual sports have different competition needs from team sports. The January start to baseball presents different issues for teams at Nebraska and Minnesota than for teams at Florida and Arizona. There are headcount sports, where a coach has a specified number of student athletes to whom he can award scholarships. In football, it's 85. There are equivalency sports, where a coach has a total amount of money to award, no limit to the number of student athletes who may receive a share, and no requirement that any receive a full share. FBF schools have the best facilities of any NCAA division or subdivision. Their student athletes have the best support services, academic, medical, nutrition, trainers, even uniforms and gear. Consider as just one example the state-of-the-art MRI that will be available to the Nebraska Athletics Department. Through its boards, councils, cabinets, and committees, the NCAA also has a diversity of roles. The Division I Legislative Council and Division I Board act as a legislature in enacting rules. The Legislative Review and Interpretations Committee interprets rules that are not clear in application. Championship committees in each sport select and seed tournament teams and set the brackets. These include March Madness and the College World Series. Rules committees decide a sport's playing rules. Over the past few years, the Women's Volleyball Committee added the libero position, eliminated side outs, and changed the number of points needed to win per set. The Committee on Academic Performance oversees team academic performance. This committee just declared UConn ineligible for the 2013 men's basketball tournament. 
Two other committees I'll discuss are the Student Athlete Reinstatement Committee and the Committee on Infractions. But first, some background. NCAA violations run the gamut from academic fraud and a coach purposefully playing ineligible student athletes to a coach sending a text message to a recruit. UNL does not teach a constitutional law class, coach a soccer game, or hand out parking tickets. Neither you nor I have ever shared a cup of coffee here at the Union with UNL. UNL, by definition and necessarily, acts through the people associated with it. It commits a violation whenever we do. Louis Quatorz has famously said, l'état c'est moi. When a UNL coach, staff member, student athlete, or even a booster commits a violation, she might just as well say, UNL, c'est moi. A student athlete's culpability for violations is handled by the Student Athlete Reinstatement Committee. This committee decides what it will take before a student athlete again is eligible to compete. It does no fact finding. Instead, it relies on an institution's rendition of what violations were committed, how and why. This committee handled the reinstatement to eligibility of Cam Newton and the eligibility decisions involving the Ohio State football players who got prohibited extra benefits in the form of free tattoos. An institution's responsibility for violations committed by its coaches, other staff members, and student athletes, and boosters, is handled by the Committee on Infractions. This committee conducts adversarial administrative type hearings and makes fact findings. It handled the USC case involving Reggie Bush, the Ohio State case with Jim Tressel and the tattoos, and the recently decided North Carolina fraud and agent case that featured John Blake. In addition to specific rules violations, a university might also lack institutional control. Lack of institutional control means that a university ignored rules violations that were known, was asleep at the switch, or had compliance and monitoring systems that just weren't good enough. Here it helps a lot to have a chancellor like Harvey Perlman, an athletics director like Tom Osborne, who set the tone and make clear their expectations, and an athletic staff like UNL that strives to do things the right way. As a private voluntary association, the NCAA has direct authority only over its members. When the Student Athlete Reinstatement Committee decides that Ohio State students need to sit out five games, it does not order them to sit out. Instead, it orders Ohio State to see to it. When the Committee on Infractions decides that Kelvin Sampson, at the time the head men's basketball coach at Indiana, may not talk to recruits, it does not order Sampson to refrain from contact. Instead, it orders Indiana to see to it. The inevitable nature of penalties is that we punish today and tomorrow for what happened yesterday or the day before. By the time an investigation and hearing are over, Reggie Bush is in the pros, and Jim Tressel has left Ohio State. Infractions committees fall, penalties fall on the new coach and on student athletes who were in high school when the violations were committed. For major infractions, the process can work no other way. In the first place, remember, the university also committed the violations, and it's against the university that penalties directly are imposed. In the second place, Penalties need to be severe if they are to deter future bad conduct. The severest penalties, scholarship reductions, TV bans, and bans on postseason, all have impact on innocent others. Finally, and maybe the most important, in a competitive athletics environment, the focus for penalties cannot be exclusively on the university in the box. Penalties also need to protect the interests of all the other schools without major violations. USC and North Carolina may complain that they are hit with severe penalties for the violations of individuals who themselves suffered little or no punishment. But you don't hear complaining from the schools that competed against USC or North Carolina or from the athletics department compliance staffs at other schools. The NCAA achieves rules enforcement through member universities fulfilling their obligations of membership. They, they self-police, they report violations, 
They see to it that their coaches, other staff members, and student athletes are educated on NCAA rules and agree in writing to be bound by them. Criminal defendants have no duty to cooperate with police or prosecutor. Their silence may not be used as evidence of guilt. Parties in civil litigation need disclose relevant information only when directly and precisely asked. Fact witnesses in litigation have no duty to come forward. By contrast, NCAA rules require coaches, other staff members, and student athletes to report their own violations and also those they suspect their friends or coworkers might have committed. Major infractions at Baylor University came to light after a basketball player was murdered by another member of the team. Dave Bliss, the head men's basketball coach at the time, attempted to cover up payments to student athletes by claiming falsely that the murdered player was killed as a result of a drug deal that went bad. An assistant coach taped his conversations with Bliss, tapes that showed he told the truth about what Bliss did. By telling on the coach who hired him and on the university that paid his salary, the assistant coach did what he was obliged to do under NCAA rules. Had he failed to report, that failure might have resulted in penalties against him. He also did the right thing as an ethical matter. That was 2003. The assistant coach has not yet gotten another college coaching job. Lawyers who represent parties in NCAA processes find it difficult to get their arms around the NCAA obligations of their clients. I presided at an infractions hearing in which a head coach charged with violations asked to see all the documents that the university had generated as part of the case. The university's lawyers gave him heavily redacted documents, claiming, among other things, that the redacted information was irrelevant to the infractions case. The head coach argued that the redactions rendered the documents unreadable, and in any event, that he was entitled to make his own independent judgment regarding whether particular information was relevant or irrelevant, a process argument. The university's lawyers ultimately provided unredacted documents. Had they not done so, process concerns might have dictated dismissal of the charges against the coach, no matter how clear his rules violative conduct. But their university client had no such process claim. It still would have taken the hit for the violations its coach committed and also get to watch while the coach walked away through the efforts of its own lawyers. OK, thus ended my scamper through the organizational structure of the NCAA and the obligations of member universities and, individu excuse me, and individuals. Now let's look at some of the process challenges to developing NCAA rules and, and policies. First, when writing rules or policies, don't get ahead of the knowledge base. What everyone thinks is true often is not. The NCAA has a first-rate research staff, headed by Todd Petter, son of UNL Emeritus Professor Jerry Petter, but they are not always asked. Second, just like parents, those making policy should not sweat the small stuff. It neither is efficient nor cost-effective to enforce rules for every single situation, and it makes for a very large rule book. On campus, chancellors and presidents work at the policy articulation level and rely on others for program implementation and administration. By contrast, the Division I board, comprised of chancellors and presidents, both articulates policy and has taken on an operational role. The board may be the only entity that can drive decisions when there is disagreement among stakeholders. It also can move legislation quickly but the board also has adopted rules without sufficient input from stakeholders. In the race to make needed change, it sometimes has inadequately appreciated all the implications of a particular policy choice. The third challenge to NCAA rulemaking is striking the right balance for board action. Athletics administrators implement NCAA policy and are first on the hook when something goes wrong. They may be best placed to understand all policy ramifications. Their perspective is absolutely essential. 
but so is the voice of the greater campus. A fourth process challenge, then, is to assure that all voices are heard loud and clear. A fifth challenge to effective process is to get all the stakeholders talking or singing at the same table and at the same time. Once upon a time, the Division I Academics Cabinet had no senior athletics administrator with broad-based responsibilities. And the Recruiting Cabinet had no faculty athletics rep. As a process matter, that meant that neither cabinet was best positioned fully to air issues and perspectives before policy was articulated, positions became entrenched, and change might require significant time and reworking. Process also dictates that, sharehold, that stakeholder participation can be effective and stakeholders will have buy-in only if they are in the information loop. A recurrent process failing of the NCAA is reluctance to share information when policy is in the development stage, the very time when communication and input are most needed. Yet another process challenge is NCAA proclivity for hard and fast term limits for service on boards, cabinets, councils, and committees. Critical to any association are new voices and new ideas. At the same time, new voices lack experience to match the established roles and institutional memories of NCAA staff. New voices also may lack a recognized visibility that gives status to be heard over the cacophony of a bureaucracy. Another prime process failing is evaluating change in isolation. Rules and policy development is like a game of Jenga. Before changing a rule or adopting a new one, you should account for how it affects all the others. A related process failing, one to which the NCAA is particularly susceptible, is to keep changing the rules. We don't annually rewrite the basketball rule book or how gymnastics is scored, for obvious reasons. Even Todd Petter and a great research staff cannot provide good data on the efficiency and impact of rules if they constantly are in flux. Yet another process challenge is recognizing that rules and policies do not exist in a static world. People are smart. When you change the rules on us, we adjust. In its 1984 Orange Bowl game against Miami, Nebraska was down by a point with time running out. Coach Osborne had two choices, to play it safe, kick the extra point, and walk away with a tie, and probably a national championship, or to go for the riskier two-point conversion and the win. Today, he'd have a third choice, going for a tie in regulation time and the win in overtime. Would he still have gone for the two points? Another prime policy failing is to measure incremental change only incrementally. The NCAA men's basketball tournament started with just eight teams. Imagine that. Each change leading to the current 68 team field was small. The difference between 8 and 68 is monumental. The Tower of Pisa each year leans a teeny bit more. The extra lean cannot be seen by the unassisted eye. And yet, each year's additional lean brings the tower that much closer to toppling. To understand fully all policy implications, we must measure change not only against a policy's last most recent iteration, but also against what the policy was when it was first implemented. Otherwise, the NCAA risks loss of grounding in its core values. When Adam and Eve ate the apple and were banned from Eden, we lost the chance for perfection. The best we can now manage is optimum. Perhaps a major challenge to rule and policy making is what I like to call the toothpaste tube principle. If you apply enough pressure to a cap tube of toothpaste, the toothpaste oozes through. If you plug up that hole and again apply pressure, the toothpaste just oozes elsewhere. Adopting optimum policy means acknowledging that the toothpaste necessarily is going to ooze and resolving competing interests with the least predicted ooze. In other words, the least predicted bad consequence. The easiest way to kill a good proposal 
is to identify a bad consequence, because optimum means they're going to be those. Like a snowflake, no situation in all its minute particulars is exactly like all others. The toothpaste tube principle acknowledges that we can, we can craft an optimum rule, but we can't craft a perfect one. A related pro process challenge is to avoid the quest for perfection in applying a rule. Otherwise, situation by situation, snowflake by snowflake, we upend the optimum rule we work so hard to craft. And we lose efficiency, the appearance of fairness, and most important, the overall distributive justice that comes from consistent application of a general good rule. Another major process challenge to developing and enforcing Division I rules and policies is that they are developed and then enforced as a one-size-fits-all, even though the NCAA is anything but. Combine all 14 policy challenges, and in particular, the toothpaste tube principle, NCAA diversity, and a one-size-fits-all approach. Welcome to Division I rule and policy making. Last August, NCAA President Mark Emmert appointed several presidential working groups to look closely at Division I operations. Right now, athletic scholarships may not exceed tuition and fees and room board and required books. One rallying cry for reform was to permit schools to cover the full cost of attendance in an athletic scholarship. For out-of-state students at UNL, that would be around $3,400 and also to give student athletes in equivalency sports a percentage of cost of attendance equal to the percentage of their equivalency. Then the presidential working group got going. It proposed limiting extra scholarship funds to cost of attendance or 2,000, whichever is less, and to exclude equivalency student athletes from receiving a share. When the proposal was announced, Various constituencies immediately weighed in. Some schools said they could not afford another 2,000 in athletic scholarships and did not want any other school to be able to do it. Some schools still wanted to provide full cost of attendance. Then came what I affectionately call the math wizards. They argued that they were disadvantaged because their full cost of attendance was less than 2,000 even though that means they could meet all unmet need, and under the working group proposal, schools like Nebraska can't. Many groups wanted inclusion of equivalency student athletes. Others believed that adoption of the proposal would put them out of compliance with federal gender equity standards under Title IX. That was the lawyer and the teacher joining the table, by the way. Uh, still others opposed because they believed, as a matter of philosophy, that any additional scholarship funds should go only to student athletes with financial need, or because they believed, as a matter of philosophy, that student athletes already are treated too favorably when compared with all other students on campus. The Division I Board sent the $2,000 proposal back to the Presidential Working Group with a direction to think some more. It now has rethought. Two basic proposals are on the table. One alternative provides 2,000 or cost of attendance, whichever is less, to all headcount student athletes and an equivalency percentage to student athletes in equivalency sports. The other alternative restricts those eligible to receive the 2,000 or an equivalency percentage thereof to student athletes with financial need. This latter proposal is encountering opposition from the groups you'd expect, plus a new opposition group has emerged. This one opposes a needs-based allocation as a matter of philosophy, because until now, athletic scholarships have been exclusively performance-based, like academic scholarships or those awarded music majors. And for this group, interjecting a needs-based analysis is both unduly complicated and a game-changer. Stay tuned for how all this turns out. Had I but whirled enough in time, I'd now offer detailed process solutions. But alas, instead, a few observations. Fundamentally, we need to get out of the regulatory mentality 
and the notion that we can adopt rules that make things even and offset natural and other advantages that accrue to schools, as if limiting recruiting phone calls can offset the fact that Miami has warm weather and beaches. We need to rid ourselves of the notion that by regulating every minutia, we can keep bad actors from acting badly even in the minutia, and that trying to do so is worth the cost. We need to rid ourselves of the notion that by limiting the number of meals provided to student athletes, which we do, or refusing to provide full cost of attendance, that we thereby can contain the spending of athletics departments with budgets upward of 75 million to what those with budgets of 20 million can afford. And finally, we need to rid ourselves of the notion that somehow, some way, we can keep that toothpaste tube from oozing. Now, how to do all this? Uh, to uh, use Hamlet's words, ah, there's the rub. First and foremost, by cutting down the rule book and getting rid of a lot of the rules. Easy in theory, sensible in theory, very difficult in execution. In the meantime, there is widespread talk about a crisis in college athletics. You've heard it. The arms race, bloated coach salaries, claims that scholarship student athletes can't pay their bills or that they can't do college work, and on and on. Most, if not all, of these phenomena, real or perceived, are unique to FBS schools or fall on them with much greater impact. At the same time, in the Division I voting structure, FBS schools are not the masters of their fates. In 1770, the American colonists dumped that tea because they had no say. In the Division I of 2012, everyone has a say, even when they shouldn't. Whether FBS schools or a sufficiently substantial cohort of them are on the same page regarding policy is the subject of another lecture, but they need the chance to try. Right now, athletic scholarships are awarded only one year at a time. The Presidential Working Group proposed that schools have the discretion to award multi-year scholarships. The Division I Board adopted the multi-year scholarship proposal with no stakeholder input. Then came the override effort. In Division I overrides, each school and conference has one vote. 367 schools and conferences may vote. 332 did. To succeed, 62.5% of those voting have to support an override. A little more than 62.1% did. The Ivy League voted six to one with one abstention against the override and four multi-year scholarships. Their votes carried the day. So, Division I schools may offer multi-year scholarships, even though more than 55% of Division I opposes them, and more than 62% of those who voted, and even though multi-year scholarships survived an override because of votes from the Ivy League. Now, just take a moment and think about this. Ivy League schools award no scholarships, not for a day, not for a month, not for a year, not in any amount. And yet, they cleared the table and trumped everybody. <laughs> the NCAA, much discussed, much misunderstood, much maligned, but a malicious evil empire? More accurate to say that the NCAA is much challenged and much burdened, and maybe overwhelmed. Thanks so much for coming. Joe, on behalf of the Research Council, thank you so much. That was a great lecture. The way we're going to do question and answer is to please come to this mic because we're live streaming um, the, the lecture. So we'll arrange question and answer. Just come on up to the mic or I can walk around. Fall on people. <laughs> Good 
given the way of, I should say, fever of libertarianism that's sweeping North America, do you think that effort will ever turn to the subject of the regulation of amateur athletics? <coughs> Sorry, I coughed and didn't hear you. Could you just repeat? <coughs> given the fever that's sweeping across North America of libertarianism, do you think that movement will ever turn its attention to the subject of the regulation of amateur athletics? I, right now, there's an effort to try, but whether it's going to be successful or not is an entirely different question. <clears throat> and I guess I would say, not, maybe not directly at libertarianism, but more generally, is that we're, oh, it's always easy, we always find it easy to want to deregulate when it's something that doesn't affect us, but we have a very different interest when the regulation looks like something that's goring our ox. <coughs> Other questions for Joe? Can you give us any idea of the proportionality <coughs> of uh, input and impact that student athletes are able to have on what the any idea of the proportionality of the student athletes, even though they're here, only here for three to five years, are they able to have any impact on NCAA, or is it just a group of, as is athletics everywhere in the world, is it a group of old men making sure that young people do what the old men want to do? And sometimes old women these days. Uh, yeah, in, in fact, the way, the way, let me back up a little. Uh, the way athletics is structured uh, is that on every campus, in every athletics department, there's a student athlete ac ac um, advisory committee uh, that can weigh in on a campus on any issue it, it so chooses. And then at every conference level, there are representatives from the campus SAC to the conference SAC, and the NCAA also has a national SAC. On a lot of the committees, there is a there is a, a committee place for a student athlete. Um, the, in my experience, student athletes, if they feel very strongly about a particular proposal, and they have reasons for it, can carry a vote. And they have carried votes. Now, that doesn't happen very frequently, obviously. There's also an effort on campuses, certainly at Nebraska, through life skills. Uh, to try to find ways to involve student athletes and put them in leadership roles. Other questions? What's the most serious infraction that you've ever had to, had to deal with, either maybe here at Nebraska or elsewhere in your role on the infractions committee? Well, it wouldn't be here at Nebraska. Good, good. We, <laughs> we don't even get into the waiting pool when we're talking about infractions. Um, well, I, I sat on the Alabama case that I talked about where there was really big money. And what I didn't say about that case was that 140, and it was probably 160,000, did not go to the student athlete or the student athlete's family. It was a high school, high school coach with, that was shopping him around to colleges and finding the biggest bidder. And the money went to the high school coach who ultimately was indicted. And I think he spent some prison time once that case was fully done. Um, another really big case was the Florida State academic fraud case uh, in which, which had the, inv and, and it was big, not simply because it was academic fraud, which is big in itself, but it, because it had the involvement of a couple of people who were athletics academic tutors, and it also had the involvement of one of the counselors who was at a higher level in terms of uh, the, you know, the institutional uh, structure. So those were two. I would say were the two biggest ones over the over the years that uh, that I know of. Now the Baylor case that I mentioned was a major case, but mainly because of what happened independent of what you would call NCAA infractions. It was the murder of a of a college kid. Uh, and the effort of the coach to try to uh, cast him as a drug dealer and uh, push the whatever the whatever the circumstances of the case were away from athletics. Uh, and there have been other big cases, you know, in which some of the other things that are really not NCAA matters provided a context that made them pretty significant. 
Excellent uh, presentation, uh, Joe. And I have to ask a question about money. Uh, you know, does NCAA, where it sees that it has potentially can play a role in societal change uh, in both in scholarship and research, uh, that as well as education in some of the issues? So does NCAA get involved, even funding some of those initiatives? Uh, do you have any, any information on that? Yeah, it does a little. Jim O'Hanlon, who's in the audience here and who has been dean at several places in his career uh, here and done a good job at all of them, and I got some research funds out of the NCAA several years ago now to do a research project with student athletes in FBS schools. Uh, there are other research projects that are funded. Steve Wilborn, uh, who's also here, used to be chair of the research, the NCAA Research Council, which awarded some funds. But it's, you know, it's not even a rounding error when you look at the money that the, uh, the men's basketball tournament generates. Um, I have a question that has been asked of me and I didn't know how to answer it, so I'll ask you because hopefully you will be able to. Um, how does the Title IX requirements work when you have a male sport like football that has so many scholarships and yet, and there's no, there's no female sport that has even half the number of student athletes that are on a football scholarship and there, and at least at this point, they're all male. Yeah, well, uh, let, me, let me say one thing is a little bit of a digression and then get back. Uh, equestrian right now can give you numbers equivalent to football. And equestrian as an emerging sport, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon to me. You can compete in equestrian if you've never been on a horse before because they have a, I don't know what they call it, no, it has to be less than novice category. Uh, so there, there are sports out there in which there, are, there can be numbers equivalent to football. But to get to the, to the, the real question, uh, Title IX with regard to athletics can be met in three different ways. Uh, one of the ways in 2012 probably is off the table, but so there are two basic ways. One is if you're meeting the full participation interests of women students at, on your campus or women uh, in your conference. And so you can do that by doing surveys and, and talking to the club teams and the, you know, to find out if there's any interest in making a varsity sport. And so you can do that. And then you don't have to match number for number because if you don't have that interest, you've met 100% of the interest that's there, you're okay. Uh, that's a very difficult way to meet Title IX, and there are fewer and fewer schools to try to do it that way. The other way to do it is you have to, if you, is you have to be equivalent into a very close percentage equivalence, probably 1% now, of the uh, measuring the, your male student athletes and female student athletes and the population at your, on your campus, and you've got to get within a percentage of proportion to each. Uh, what schools do to get there when you have football teams with 85 is they cap the number of athletes that can participate on other men's sports. You could have 100 male athletes who want to be on your tennis team, and they're all going to come out and compete for no scholarship money, and you can't take them because their numbers will put the men's side of the equation too high as compared to the women's side. And right now, you know, maybe in 10 years or 20 years it will change, I have my doubts, but right now at least, the interest in participating in varsity athletics at a major school and putting in the time and effort and everything else is not equivalent among men and women, at least when we're talking about no scholarships to do it. In other words, you can get lots of male athletes to walk on on teams, and it's not likely that you can do it in, on many women's teams. So the only way then that you're going to be able to match it is to cap the male sports. So I talked to a tennis coach once, for example, who was the tennis coach for men and women at his university. And he said, you know, I've got the men's team and I've got kids lining up who just want to be on the team, you know, and, you know, practice with the team and maybe get a chance to come in once and they're not getting any scholarship money. And I've got the women's team where I can't fill all the scholarships. 
So I said, well, you're, this is in your control. I mean, other coaches don't even, you can do it because you're doing both teams. I said, why don't you just give scholarships you know, to, to, to women whether you think they're good, or, you know, they're good enough to compete or not? And he said, well, now you're not talking like a coach, which clearly is true. Uh, uh, he said, I can't you know, field a team where I'm giving out scholarships to women who don't come out to practice and aren't working hard and are not doing all the other things it takes just to keep my numbers up because then it'll help me on the men's side. So that's a very long answer. I apologize for it. Uh, I hope I was responsive to the particular question and I hope I gave you some interesting context, if not useful. Um, there's such a large number um, in, in many colleges where there are more female undergraduate students than there are male undergraduate students. That then would seem to tip the balance it does. even more. It does. I talked to um, an individual um, at a f uh, university that was formerly a military school. So therefore, it started out as having only men. And it's not Texas A&M. Uh, <laughs> it's another one. Uh, and he said, and I quote him, or I paraphrase him at least, I don't know why people are having trouble with Title IX. We don't have any trouble at all. Well, their school has 30% women and 70% men. Of course they don't have trouble meeting Title IX requirements. Yeah, it's a, big, it's a big problem. And it's a logistical problem also, because you measure it against your own population at your school, and you may be in a conference where you're competing against that school that's 70-30 and another school that's 60-40, and another school that may be 50-50, so, so that the, uh, the, uh, the difficulty in getting there is not evenly distributed in, 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 among the schools in your own conference. Is the NCAA a state actor, and why or why not? <coughs> I have an article out there for submission right now that says no. Well, actually, there's a Supreme Court case that says no. Um, they're not a state actor because, well, let me, <coughs> let me put my constitutional hat on, law hat on for a second. Uh, to be a state actor, you have to be a state or a public agency, or you have to perform uh, functions that a state traditionally does. I'm now, I'm, I'm, don't hold me to this, anybody who's from the law school, I'm simplifying it a little. Uh, so you can, you're a state actor if you're the state of Nebraska, obviously. You're the state actor if you're UNL. Uh, you can be a state actor if you're the private person running the prison system for the state. And from time immortal, the prison system was run by a state. You don't get to be a state actor just because you're big or you're influ influential or you're national or any of those reasons. The NCAA, in form, is like a big backyard club. You can join, you can leave. You don't like it, you don't have to stay. So that's why it's not a state actor in law. Uh, as to whether it should be or not, the article that I just finished says it doesn't make any difference for a number of reasons. One of them being if you're in an NCAA where, where most of your members are state actors, you cannot, as a member association, be doing things where you can say, aha, you can't get me because I'm not a state actor. And yet UNLV you know, or Nebraska may get sued because they are. It's just not possible over the long run for that to be the way the, you know, the thing works. And in addition, and, in for, and a good example of that is uh, when Jerry Tarkanian Ter sued many years ago, he was the former men's basketball coach at UNLV who committed violations at UNLV, and the infractions committee found that he committed <coughs> violations. And at the time, a coach who committed violations did not appear before the infractions committee or make a presentation. Now, the reason was the association is the members. The employee of the school is not a member of the association, so the only people in the room were the association members. Even though clearly what would happen in that room would have impact on you if you were the head coach and it was your conduct that they were talking about. So when the violations came out uh, and UNLV had to enforce them, and UNLV is a state actor, he complained and went to court. The NCAA w won that case. The Supreme Court of the United States said, you're not a state actor. And nonetheless, 
The NCAA appointed a blue ribbon committee that had a former Chief Justice on it and the former Solicitor General of the United States on it, and they went ahead and went out and looked at NCAA rules and rewrote them to conform with what due process would require of a state actor. So that's a good example of, of why it does conform and it has to conform at least over time. I could say more about it, but I won't. Without questioning the integrity of any of the staff or bureaucracy of the NCAA, would you guess that there is a direct relation between the growth of the record book and the growth of the bureaucracy? <laughs> In other words, I guess my curiosity is, is that I'm not sure which evil comes first. Maybe that's unfair to say evil, but which comes first? The more people you have whose living is based on perpetuating the minutia, the sweating the small stuff, and the growth of that small stuff. Yeah, I don't know that I could answer. I would say that the bureaucracy and this, this over-regulating is an entrenched mentality. Now, who's responsible for digging the hole that made it so deep? It's hard to say. I mean, uh, the, uh, but it's certainly not the staff independent of what goes on on campus. I mean, we have an instinct, all of us, if you see something goes wrong, you want to run out and, and, and create a rule about it. You're always looking at yesterday, so you have a rule full of rule books and the conduct doesn't occur again because I'm not going to do it the same way. If I don't want to break the rules, I won't do it that way. I'll just find a different way to do it. So the rule book gets bigger and bigger, and I think most of that is generated by the campuses. Most proposals, well, let me, I'll say something about NCA process. The NCA staff uh, typically does not generate legislative proposals. Now last year with, with Mark Emmert, uh, he wanted to do something at the, you know, the high staff level to prune the rule book. And once in a while, you get a top-down initiative about, excuse me, we need to do something through the Division I board. But by and large, the proposals percolate up. Uh, so every year, uh, a conference will submit 20 or 30 proposals into a legislative cycle. And a lot of them will be tweaking the rule that you just put in place a year ago or two years ago, or knitting so far out at the periphery that you need binoculars you know, to get there and see it. So I don't think it's mostly the staff, although I will say, and I don't think it's the staff saying, gee, if we have more rules, this is great for us. But I will say that when the bureaucracy gets entrenched, then the people in the middle of that ditch may be the hardest to see that there's got to be a, a different way to approach things. All right, any other questions? Yep. Meet you halfway, how about that? Uh, so you're saying that uh, paying players is fundamentally wrong because it creates an unequal playing field, uh, which is capitalism, but the money goes elsewhere to other people, which is essentially exploitation. Um, how is that any more fair than paying the players themselves? I'm not sure I said any of that, but I'd be happy to respond to the question nonetheless. Pay, uh, paying student athletes brings in a host of other issues that one would have to deal with. And it completely reverses the model by which we think of student athletes right now. Now, could we do it? Sure. But it does upend it because we don't currently think of student athletes, whether it's a football player or a track player or the swimmer on the swim team, as being employees of the university. To pay them would change that. It brings in a number of practical difficulties, such as do you really, really want to bring in the labor laws and have football teams be able to strike? Do you really want your quarterback be able to have an agent to negotiate what his salary is going to be? Should the quarterback be paid more than the fullback on the team? Should the fullback be paid more than the swimmer on the swim team? Should the swimmer on the swim team be paid more than you can see where we're going? And it's going to come directly in conflict with Title IX issues with regard to even treatment. So that's one, that's the, uh, some of the practical reasons, I would say, are, are one 
whole set of reasons why I would say not paying players. The other is you really are changing the model fundamentally. Now having said that, move over to issues such as name and likeness where the NCAA can, you know, during March Madness, show players in their name and likeness and they're making money off that right of publicity. It seems to me then we're talking about something very different in terms of the collegiate model. When uh, Emma Watson, is that her name? She, the Hermione from the Harry Potter movies? Do you know? You're not gonna admit that you know even if you know, I can see that. <laughs> All right, Emma Watson. When she's at Brown University as a student, she was enrolled at Brown University, she can go out and make a movie. If she wants to do an advertisement or a commercial or endorse a product, nobody stops her and nobody says, well, if you do that, you're no longer a student. You've now become something else. So it seems to me with regard to name and like likeness, we really do need to rethink what we're doing. Now that said, when Emma Watson goes out and makes that movie or sells that cup or do, does whatever she's doing, we, what, what she's generating is her own uh, work product. Nobody claims that she's able to sell to get a million dollars to make a movie or sell a t-shirt with her name on it because she happens to be a student at Brown University. On the other hand, when you're talking about student athletes, take a star quarterback on a football team. He's not as good, even if you love your football team at your college, uh, he's not as good as the players who are playing in the NFL. Maybe Andrew Luck in two or three years will be as good as the players in the NFL. He wasn't, th he wasn't that when he was a freshman at Stanford. So the name value that they're generating is not coming from themselves alone. It's coming because they're playing for Stanford or Nebraska or Notre Dame or Texas or Tennessee or Alabama. And so if we move into saying they're entitled to that profit, that they're generating because of their own efforts, we have to get some economists in to figure out what exactly we're talking about. Other questions? Okay, I'm gonna turn the mic over to Prem. Thank you, Susan. Thanks, Joe, fantastic presentation. And so here is a copy of the poster for your office. And sim oh. one uh, copy, uh, a similar will be, uh, we'll actually hang it in the research office forever and ever and ever. So thank you very much. Okay. Let me say to Prem, money is nice too. <laughs> <laughs>